we just said it. They said nothing to anyone, close. And then somebody puts an ending that says, and then they went forth and proclaimed the glorious gospel of Christ and salvation to the whole world. You know, new ending, yeah, that's right. which <laughs> really definitely doesn't. Hello, lovely people. Welcome back to my channel. Welcome if you are new. My name is Emma. Today I bring you a delightful interview that I had with Professor James Tabor. His publication history is super impressive. He's worked on some really amazing archaeological digs and excavations in the Holy Land. Today we're going to be talking about the Gospel of Mark, which is so much less known and less taught than, say, Matthew. We're going to look at the differences between Mark and the other texts, which inspired each other, what the historical context was. It's really interesting and very useful in understanding the biblical context and history of the Gospels. I hope you really enjoy. I will see you after the interview. I am joined today by Dr. James Table. Thank you so much for joining me. Welcome. Good to be with you, man. Looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. This is a very exciting topic. I'm really interested in this because it's not one that I've delved into before. We are talking about Mark today and we're going to try and keep it within the realms of Mark. But I do want to start with a little bit of Mark and priority, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Most people, I think it's fair to say, will read the Bible in the order it's presented. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Um, most modern scholars... I think it's fair to say, uh, support Mark and priority, the hypothesis being that Mark was written first and then inspired uh, Matthew and Luke. Can you give us kind of a layman-friendly explanation for, you know, the evidence that Mark was this original text that sort of inspired these others? Sure, that's a good place to start. Um, I'll start with a little story. You know, when I was growing up, I grew up uh, as a Christian in a church and I probably 10 years older, so I decided I'm, I'm going to read the New Testament, you know? I mean, good boy, right? Read the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And I started through Matthew, and I, I made it through, and it was kind of pretty familiar growing up in a church. And I got to Mark, and I thought, I've, I've already heard this. This is kind of like, re like a concise recap or something. So I think I almost like paged through it without really paying much attention to it. And then Luke seemed to be repeating, but it had a lot of more good stuff. And then John, oh yeah, John, that's the great one. You know, that's the spiritual gospel for believers. So Mark just got, even for me as a pious reader, trying to, you know, read God's word as I took it at the time, uh, it got marginalized. And as I was marginalizing it, and it turns out that if it was in fact the first one, the foundational story, and we're calling this course that we're going to talk about creating Jesus, how Mark, how and why Mark was forgotten. And one of the reasons it's forgotten is it seems to repeat the others, Matthew and Luke. But by a careful comparison side by side and columns that you do with, you know, synopsis of the Gospels, so-called harmony, as some people call it, because it's not very harmonious you begin to realize that things are always flowing a certain way. That is, there's a base text, Mark, and Matthew and Luke are rewritten Mark. And that becomes very important. That's kind of a core of part of this course that I'm teaching. I'll give you just an example that people could just look up really easily, is in Mark 2, when Jesus heals this paralyzed guy and he has to be let down through the roof. And there's this very dramatic story in Mark. It's pretty long. Matthew just cuts that down. And he basically just says, uh, they brought a man to Jesus and he healed him and everybody glorified God. And so t that happens again and again with Matthew. He's interested in the glory, hallelujah, like Jesus did a great miracle. But what he leaves out are the things that are really very important to Mark, and it just happens constantly. Even better example might be Mark has a scene that Matthew, I think he hates it. And it is, I don't think these people are friends. I don't, I think they're, they're dealing with competing versions of the Jesus story. Mm -hmm. And Mark has a story uh, where somebody comes up to Jesus and says, good master, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why are you calling me good? There's none good but God. Well, for Matthew, that's kind of a problem. First of all, he wants him to be good, certainly, but none good but God. So what does he do? He, he, he changes it. He edits it. Uh, why are you asking me about the good? So all of a sudden, it's not 
how do I inherit eternal life? But why are you asking me about the good? And then he kind of repeats Mark. So this goes on many, many times in Mark, and Mark gets rewritten for that reason, kind of marginalized. And then once you put it in the context, like I was saying of the New Testament, Matthew is just towering. It clearly is the church's gospel. It was put in first and Mark comes later. And it seems to many, many readers uh, that it's just a repeat. So I wouldn't even call it a second or third edition. For years, I used to say that. I would say to students, you know, Mark's the first edition and Matthew's the second and it's the, th but that's assuming it's the same work by the same author. And the author's just updating and improving and correcting like I would do in a second edition or a third edition of one of my books. But that's not what is happening. I think it's overwriting, rewriting, and basically marginalizing. There's Mark is a problem. Mark and priority is bedrock. Uh, and when it first emerged in the 1830s and 40s in Germany with critical scholarship beginning, it was, it, it was really pretty much a pillar of New Testament studies in the academic world, and it still is. But the original people that were touting Mark thought it would be the most accurate historically. That's why they got all excited. Oh, Mark is the original, so it's like going to be better than these later embellished Gospels. Well, that may be true on one level, but on another level, if you ask, well, what is in that original story? I would even argue that it's a kind of a counter gospel. It, it actually is not the gospel that emerges from Christianity at all. And so it's, it, it's a sort of an embarrassment to some degree, like the passage I just mentioned, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. No birth narrative at all. Mm -hmm. Divinity is up for grabs depending on what you mean by son of man and son of god and uh, all of that is covered as we go through very carefully it's so fascinating it's interesting i, th I think as i understand it's quite marks quite different stylistically as well um, it is it, it's others. of course the the main thing even english readers note is this constant use of immediately he goes here and immediately he goes there and so forth mm -hmm. so it's it's an action gospel but on the other hand, there, there are teachings. Uh, it's very different from Matthew and Luke because they have this teaching source that some people call Q. I don't really care what you call it. It's the material Matthew and Luke have in common. It tends to be teachings of Jesus. By definition, Mark doesn't have any of that. That's how we distill it out of Matthew and Luke by taking mm -hmm. out Mark. But Mark does have teachings of Jesus quite a bit. But the problem is, and the interesting thing about them, they're all riddles and enigmas. It's not straightforward teaching. And nobody in the drama of Mark, it, it, I, I do argue that it's presented as a three-part drama. Nobody understands it, uh, except a couple of stray unnamed characters that you pick out as you go along. And so it works very differently from a kind of glory, hallelujah, Jesus is the Lord, He's born of a virgin, he's raised from the dead, he's our leader, hook yourself to him, and you'll have eternal life. Well, just from the verse I first alluded to, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. And somebody's asking about eternal life. Why doesn't he say, believe on me, and uh, you'll have eternal life? Because that isn't what Mark thinks. It's really, really different in that sense. Which is fundamental to kind of you know, modern Christian sort of practices, which is so interesting. I think um, it, it, to be contrary and jump all the way to the end for a second, uh, I'd like to get your opinion on this and, and understand how this sort of factors into your reading. The ending of Mark, Mark seems to end quite abruptly. It's sort, sort of a shocking cliffhanger of a thing. Um, then there's there's this sort of extension that you sometimes get to mark mark 16 9 to 20 that's and right most versions of the bibles come with a little this version does not appear in the earliest some of the earliest manuscripts i've seen this debated but i understand the sort of general consensus among scholars at least is that mark should sort of end at 16 8 can you tell us why it, that's the case how this how this yeah. happened 
it, well, there's actually three what I would call appended endings that were added later, but it mm -hmm. definitely ends at verse eight, as I understand it. And as we cover it in the course, that's obviously one of the big things we cover at the end. And I don't mind you skipping to the end because the end is pretty dramatic in an anticlimactic way. Yeah. But the last view we get of Jesus is he's dead on the cross. This is the last scene of Jesus. And he's just said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's all he says on the cross. That's another reason why you can't conflate these. Like, I think Jesus says seven things on the cross. Catholics know the seven sayings on the cross. Mark just has one. Well, it's pretty different to have seven versus one. And if that one is, God forsook me, <laughs> and I'm wondering why, and then he's dead. And then a Roman centurion says, surely this was the son of God. That's the last we see. So then when you come to this tomb that is discovered by the women early Easter morning, as we call it today, uh, there's no Jesus. He's just gone. And he's, he, they're told they'll see him in the Galilee as he said, which is referring back to this uh, transfiguration scene, I think, earlier in chapter nine of Mark. And so the added endings that you mentioned, uh, verses nine through 20, and actually there are two or three more, depending on the manuscripts that you go to. One way you can, you can kind of reason backward with them, if you read that ending of nine through 20, which is the most common one, it was in the King James Version, mm -hmm. it's in all conservative Bible translations, it's clearly been cobbled together where somebody's not happy with the ending of Mark being so sudden. The women fled from the tomb in trembling and fear and said nothing to anyone, period. And picture the play, the curtain goes down and the audience is sitting there going, what? Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> they said nothing to anyone? And like, it's, it's one of those... You know, it's like a movie where you're in the theater and all of a sudden you go, it's over? We've all seen films like that. They're usually considered it's like very a, a good a tragedy. Films. It's a tragic cliffhanger. Yeah, 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 and you then have to figure it out. You have to figure it out. You're, you're the one that has to deal with that. Well, obviously, that's not good for catechism. <laughs> so you got to say, wait, wait, and then he appeared, and then he did this, and then he did that, and he ate fish, and he was definitely it, and... And Mark doesn't do any of that because I don't even think Mark believes in any kind of bodily resurrection. Uh, but that's another subject. But anyway, if you look at those uh, cobbled endings, what someone has done is taken the ending of Matthew, the ending of Luke, and the ending of John and just put them all together. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see that when you read it. Has the two men on the road to Emmaus? That's there. That's from Luke. It has the Mary Magdalene story that's there because that's from Matthew and so forth. And then it even has them on the mountain in, in the Galilee where they get the Great Commission from Matthew. So uh, that's what's happening with those endings. And then the other two are even just crazier. I, I, I don't have them memorized, but it's like, and they went for, it just says, you know, we just said, it, they said nothing to anyone, close. And then somebody puts an inning that says, and then they went forth and proclaimed the glorious gospel of Christ and salvation to the whole world. You know, new ending, yeah, right. <laughs> which really definitely doesn't. So what's happened, it's Bible marketing. How are you gonna sell a Bible to the evangelical world? And if you're gonna do a Bible, you've gotta to appeal to the believing market as well as the skeptical market, not just the academic. You're not gonna sell many copies. Mm -hmm. So even in the new revised standard or all the academic translations, they'll put a gap and, and yet there'll be a note, uh, some authorities uh, consider this other ending to be later and derivative and not really authentic or real or original, but they still print it. And that way it's there. And if you don't bother to look at the note, then it's okay. When the RSV first came out and let's see, it was in I think 1940s and 50s, uh, people were burning the RSV because it printed that ending in small print at the end. That's gone. Wow. Now they put it in the regular size print. <laughs> so that's one of the problems. But you're absolutely right to go to the ending. 
the be beginning and ending of Mark, uh, the last verse of Mark and the first verse of Mark are actually the key to the enigma and to the mystery. And I'm not going to give that away <laughs> right now, but uh, it's, it's pretty fair. amazing. And people were, you know, nobody's read Mark. You know, you, you think people have, but they haven't. Rattling around in their head is just all the stuff they've sort of heard or picked up or if they grew up in, you know, a church or whatever. And obviously I'm exaggerating. Some people have read it. But in this course, you pull it out and you let it function as a separate document, not as something used by another author, but literally Mark is Mark. And it's like you don't know anything else and you just have to empty your head and, and read it. And then it maybe will work for you if you could just let it speak. And uh, I've, I've taught it now for decades with students in college and it, it's magic what happens in the classroom. And I tend to get evangelical students I teach in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And after about three or four weeks, they're just like, they love it. They absolutely love it because they're learning so much. And I leave it to them to integrate that back with their other stuff. That's their problem. Mm -hmm. but, but we're doing it as a, you know, I think it's the most, let me, let me put it this way. It's the most influential, least influential piece of literature on the planet How about that. That's a fantastic way of putting it. Absolutely. And it is. And I would defend it because yeah. if we didn't have it, we wouldn't have the Jesus story. It is the Jesus story. It's the core. Mm -hmm. Even, even I think John uses it too. That's been agreed now by most of us. It is the Jesus story, but nobody's listening to it anymore. We don't mm -hmm. hear the original Jesus story. It's gone. It's lost. It's forgotten. So for, for just to pull out of the story for a moment um, and sort of talk about the history, I, I believe, and I've seen this debated, um, whether uh, Mark was sort of written either just before or just after uh, the destruction of the second Jerusalem temple. Um, either way, there's when you read it, it feels like there's quite clearly a sort of background of, of war um, and sort of fear around that. Is there anything you can tell us about the historical context that should sort of influence our reading or that you can see represented in the text? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's it's the most apocalyptic. Uh, Paul's letter, say, to the Corinthians would be a comparison in the 50s where the end is coming so quickly that you shouldn't even get married or go into business or do anything really because the mm -hmm. whole thing is collapsing. And Mark is also living in that world. I would tend to put it uh, after the destruction of Jerusalem. And it's being written for the generation that is passing already and, and getting pretty slim with the view that that generation will not pass until everything is fulfilled. And that's mm -hmm. clearly stated. And the kingdom is going to arrive. And yet in Mark, he, the author, we're calling him Mark. We don't know who wrote it, by the way. Uh, the early fathers attributed church fathers uh, to John Mark in the book of Acts because they just need a name for it. But this is kind of late, it's second, third century. Everybody's talking about it that way. And they say, oh, it's Rome and it's the memoirs of Peter. Well, I can tell you it, it, it's far from Peter, believe me, from anything we know about Peter. And it's essentially... Uh, arguing that uh, Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple, of the whole Jewish establishment. Everything is coming down. It's a den of thieves. Remember, Mark's the one who introduces that from the book of Jeremiah. And it's all coming down. And uh, very soon you will see the Son of Man, you know, coming in the clouds of heaven and so forth. And whether that's Jesus or not is also a question in Mark. You know, what do you mean when you say the Son of Man? Because it's based upon a, a text in Daniel chapter 7. And we cover that in the course. As far as placing it, I would say a bit after, you know, we can't put exact dates. Uh, we try to do that as scholars. Like, oh, well, Mark is 75 and Matthew's 85 and Luke is 95. And one of my students will raise their hand and go, 
Did you just jump three decades kind of arbitrarily? Yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> like, <laughs> come on. Well, you know, what do you mean, Matthew's 85? You really know what's going on in the year 85 by our calendar. Uh, so <laughs> these are approximations. But we're assuming that it takes some time for things to circulate and then somebody there likes it or doesn't or uses it or abuses it or rewrites it or whatever. So if I had to pick a date, I would say 75 or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's not so long that you're giving up. It is a time of chaos and trouble. You're exactly right on that. And there are direct references to that mm -hmm. in chapter 13. It's a pretty bloody chapter when you read it of all the troubles that are going, going on for the community. But they're holding on to a single thing. And that is this appearance or parousia, as it's called. Uh, that marks the end of the age and the arrival of the kingdom of God. Of course, that never happened. And that's another reason Matthew and Luke have to adjust things. What Matthew does is he, he, he introduces three stories of delay that are not in Mark. Three stories, one, two, three, right after mm -hmm. his apocalyptic chapter 24. And what Luke does, he goes, oh, well, that was the Jews. They were, you know, the Jews were destroyed. And that was, he pretty well writes history. But as far as the end of the age, that could be any time now. You know, that it could be a hundred years, a thousand years. Luke kind of makes it uh, almost like perpetual. You know, you don't need to have the end come in that generation. In fact, even says in the book of Acts, which Luke, the author of Luke wrote, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. When the disciples asked Mark's question, is it time for the kingdom? Mark would say, absolutely. And Luke goes, well, you know, it's not for you to know. Only God knows that. So you're already getting that move away from the apocalypticism in the book of Luke. And uh, there's nothing to do in Luke except just preach the gospel to the world and continue on with the work of Christianity. That's not Mark. Yeah, but you can you start to see why that might be a necessary addition. <laughs> Absolutely, for, uh, yeah. For yeah. the Christianity of the time, yeah. So by reading Mark, I think we're capturing a moment in time that we've lost, and we're also capturing a rather delightfully told, skillful way of telling a hero story in the Hellenistic world mm -hmm. that Matthew and Luke, they're, they're, they're much more pedantic and scribal and catechetical Mark actually wants to leave you with your mouth open wondering what the hell was that about? Really, he does. I think it's very skillfully put together by the author and is, is hoping to get people to uh, kind of move from the glory hallelujah sort of uh, preaching of Jesus as the triumphant Messiah to something that's much more called the mystery of the kingdom which uh, he never explains, but you can figure out if you're careful. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to give it away yet. So I feel like you've um, covered a lot of this already, but just as like a nice sort of wrapping up, I think we've, we've discussed that it's valuable in a lot of ways to kind of pull Mark out on its own. It is so overshadowed and overlooked, especially in terms of the story of Jesus. What's your tagline? Why is it important? Why is it valuable for somebody to pull Mark out on its own and, and learn from it? I think because it represents uh, our first and earliest attempt to tell the Jesus story. And if that story gets muted, overwritten, uh, and basically so drastically altered, we're losing uh, in a huge way how it all started. So we decided to call the course Creating Jesus. And however you take that, uh, it is our first account of the story. You know, there's an old evangelical hymn I remember. I don't know the words, but I, the title was Tell Me the Story of Jesus. So Mark is telling you the story of Jesus, but it's not the story you're going to expect to hear. And I think there's a tremendous value I mean, I work in what's called Christian origins. And if you ignore the first story and don't really give that kind of full weight, then you're really missing something. I mean, think about Paul's letters. He doesn't have any story of Jesus. 
for Paul, Jesus is born of a woman, crucified, died and buried and raised the third day. I just told you the story of Jesus. Well, what's the story story? Well, he doesn't give one, right? Doesn't give teachings, doesn't give anything. So by then it's become a faith in Jesus as something. But Mark is the story, and I, I think it pays us to go back and read the story, just as a, a really, a, it's a huge building block in trying to understand how this movement was launched. Fantastic. I completely agree. Um, well, perfect. Thank you so much for your time. Very Great. excited Great. for the course. Actually dive properly into it, get all the, get all the juicy secrets. And, well, uh, thank you very much. And can't uh, wait. I hope your, your, list, your viewers and listeners uh, uh, find this fascinating as well. I'm sure they will. I certainly do. Thank you again. There we are. I hope you enjoyed that tantalizing little discussion on Mark with Dr. Tabor. It's super interesting. I can't wait for the full course. As always, I will leave links down below. If you are interested, I highly recommend. This is going to be so exciting. I will leave my affiliate link down below if you do want to check out Dr. Tabor's course on Mark, on creating the story of Jesus, the origin of Jesus that we overlook so criminally. <laughs> Uh, do use the link down below. That also helps me as a creator. I'm super grateful to be able to have these conversations. It's so fascinating. It's so great to be able to unpack the Bible in this way. From a skeptic perspective, this kind of analysis really helps to sort of fuel your understanding and, and provide a good solid ground for debunking some of the more spurious claims about Jesus, especially when you understand his origin story. Thank you so much for watching. Course details will all be down below for you. Do like this video if you enjoyed it. If you haven't subscribed, hit the old button, do a subscribe, see more of this kind of stuff. I'm really into my biblical scholarship lately. I just find it so fascinating. From a historical, a skeptical, and just a literary perspective, the books of the Bible have so much to offer for all of those things. I I just find it fascinating and I hope you do too. Before we go, I would like to give a big shout out and a thank you to my giant chickens and colossal quackers over on Patreon. <laughs>